red facility alert, fire alarm, clear for pavilion, for floor, stairwell, and attention, this is the cold red facility alert, fire alarm, for floor, stairwell, and attention, this is the cold red facility alert, fire alarm, for floor, stairwell, and All right, we'll get started. Um, so um, I'm Daniel Kapadia, in case there's anybody over there that's not sure who I am. Uh, I am the one that bombards your email and inbox between the hours of 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. Um, so today my talk is on the initial evaluation of interstitial lung disease. Um, special thanks to Dr. Dabraj and your help on this talk. Um, when I started this talk, I was going a million separate ways because it's such a big topic. So I'm gonna to try to hone in on that initial um, evaluation in terms of disclosures. I have no financial disclosures. Other disclosures include that I am sleep deprived because my baby likes to wake up at the witching hour of three o'clock and every hour thereafter. Um, so it's been a lot of fun to say the least. Um, so interstitial lung disease or the ILDs are a diffuse parenchymal lung disease and it refers to this diverse range of pulmonary disorders um, that we'll, we'll talk about. And this is from the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, kind of breaking down the diffuse parenchymal lung disease in regards to um, diseases from known causes, drug-induced, um, connective tissue disorder related, or idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, um, some of the granulomatous diseases, i.e. sarcoidosis, and then other forms. And then when you're going down the idiopathic route, uh, you know, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and then the other uh, interstitial pneumonias um, that, that we'll talk about as well. So I got my notes here, so I my other part. Um, and, you know, reading and going in with some of the, uh, the, the chest board review, it, it kind of helps break it down. You know, you have your known causes and your unknown causes, and we'll kind of work, uh, we'll kind of talk about what are some of the things that uh, you know, you'll go ahead and, and do. So the, the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia is a group of diffuse parenchymal lung diseases. Uh, and then again, also described as the ILDs. So they're a group of you know, non-neoplastic disorders that, that are from damage to the lung parenchyma uh, and have different varying patterns that we'll see on um, CT scan of inflammation of fibrosis. So when you're thinking about the interstitium is that space between the epithelial and endothelial uh, basement membranes, 
Uh, and this is the primary site of injury in these uh, idiopathic uh, interstitial pneumonias, um, but also you know, can affect the airways uh, and the vessels as well. Uh, again, just this essentially is just saying it's the um, idiopathic meaning unknown and then the types that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about. So uh, the, the CRP diagnosis, the clinical radiological pathological um, diagnosis that's up here, uh, in regards to histologic patterns showing a UIP pattern versus the CRP saying this could be like IPF uh, and a nonspecific pattern organizing and, and so on and so forth that we'll talk about a little bit in regards to um, the types moving forward. So the final diagnosis um, can be idiopathic. It, you know, a lot of this is the correlation with clinical radiological features as well as your history. So um, I can't stress that enough. And then one thing that we noticed that we'll talk about is you go ahead, you know, you're doing your workup in this patient, you get chest imaging for something uh, while you see them in clinic and you're like, oh man, okay. So now I'm starting to see this interstitial stuff. I totally forgot to ask them A, B, C, and D and so on and so forth. And so you're going back and asking questions. So at least I find myself doing that quite a bit. Um, in regards to the, the process, uh, whoops, are you guys able to see my slides? All right, I guess we'll keep going. Oh, still intro size virtually. All right, so that is not working. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, so, so coming up with the diagnosis, if you is can be difficult, and also. Um, involves the multidisciplinary conference, right? So when you go to your ILD conference, you have the ILD team, some of us are there, you got radiology, rheumatology, pathology, a lot of people all coming in together to try to make the diagnosis on these patients in regards to um, what's going on. And this is kind of hitting, hitting on that point that uh, I was talking about is, you know, you may notice a histological pattern or a radiological pattern, and then you're going back and talking to the patient Kind of go through all these things to think about some of these um, exposures. Could it be hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Did I forget to check certain labs? Did I forget to, you know, take a look at um, extremities on them or ask about GERD or you know all these other things um, in, in regards to your workup? Okay. So the the approach to patients with uh, diffuse pulmonary lung disease again a careful history as well as your physical examination, you're going to get some of your chest radiographs, either what you've ordered or um, what they've been sent with uh, when they're sent to you, as well as uh, pulmonary function testing. I'm um, going to ask them in regards to the environmental, environmental exposure, smoking status, drug use. Um, also going back with, with, with dates, like you know, when does your symptoms start? What were the things that you've noticed and things like that? We saw a patient the other day where they, they noticed their patient, where they noticed their symptoms um, coming on after they were doing a bathroom remodeling, sanding, um, uh, sanding cabinets down and painting and things like that. Could that have been um, causing it as well? So, you know, starting with what their, their first symptoms were uh, in regards to shortness of breath, this cough that they've noticed and things like that the progression of their symptoms, the clinical course, what's happened in between there, uh, and then other, um, other disease that you may be thinking of in terms of connective tissue, tissue disease and things like that. So I, I wasn't as good as uh, Chris in, in getting all my, is it GIFs or GIFs? I, GIFs? <laughs> um, but I try to put some in here so that everybody stays awake, but I definitely don't have three per slide. Um, in regards to the diagnostic process, uh, this is you know coming 
you're studying history, physical exam, chest radiographs, PFTs, and then is this potentially idiopathic or do I have underlying um, disease or am I, am I being guided one way in regards to what are the, the things that I notice on physical exam from the history that I talked with them. Um, and then, you know, if you move along to your high res um, CT, you'll notice uh, when the radiologist is going through their interpretation of the imaging, they're talking about the distribution of the, um, the disease on the CT scan, is there traction bronchiectasis and all that kind of stuff. Is this a, a definite pattern of um, UIP, probable, all that kind of stuff, right? So that will go that way. And then I'll touch on a little bit in regards to biopsies, BAL, surgical lung biopsy, um, just to kind of stay within the scope of it. It goes a million different ways. Um, and then trying to get to the diagnosis there. So we'll talk about a little bit of um, some of these and, and some of the characteristic um, CT findings on them. So RBILD, um, you'll, you'll see sometimes these, these central lobular nodules. From, again, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, so no particular distribution. You can have upper, lower involvement. And then this was like a, a, one of the nice CTs that I saw. So you're seeing all these like diffuse uh, central lobular nodules and then kind of this cursor on it. Um, as well as this kind of diffuse ground glass changes um, with it as well. And I didn't put it, you're, you're thinking about patients who have um, a strong smoking history, you know, in that as well. Uh, DIP, so this diffuse ground glass opacities, often bilateral, basal, again, smoking related. The male predilection, I think, was two to one. Um, and kind of this nice imaging showing. Again, no question, but uh, basilar, bilateral, fairly diffuse out there as well. Um, I know Asif's going to be very happy, like LIP, <laughs> the professor himself, uh, ground glass opacity, some central lobular uh, nodules. And one thing, these randomly distributed thin wall cysts. Um, and and one, another thing to keep in mind is uh, the subcutaneous showings as well. Um, so going through, you see, I'm so used to thinking the cursors there. Uh, you see the, the thin wall cysts kind of dispersed throughout. Um, one that's fairly, or what we will probably see quite a bit also, um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, caused by repeated inhalation of antigens. So, you know, this is where you're talking about your exposure. You're getting a lot of strong history um, from, from the patient in regards to uh, any exposure that they may have had. Do they have, you know, we're asking uh, feather pillows, down comforter, birds at home, all that kind of stuff. Do you notice if your symptoms are better when you go away uh, on vacation or things like that? Or in, uh, I'm not going to get too specific, like work related and so on and so forth or not. Um, but again, mosaic attenuation and air trapping. And this was, I remember my first year as a fellow with Dr. Jennings. Uh, going over uh, some of the CT scans and a high-res CT talking about the mosaic attenuation. Um, it looks much better over here, but you can kind of see these areas uh, darker, a little bit more gray and so on and so forth going through. Um, and that can kind of tip you off uh, in, in the right clinical context and history for potentially uh, HP. And I think I got another one. I think this is the same picture, just a, a different cut also showing some of that. Um, mosaic attenuation. And, um, you know, one, one thing when we're talking about the, the, the workup for ILD is along the sides of the, the known causes, right? So we're going to do a pretty extensive history again, but also you're going to be evaluating for any underlying autoimmune disease because they have connective tissue disease related ILD um, or CT ILD. So when I had no idea what I was doing, it was like, all right, I get a whole bunch of labs and then uh, please go see Dr. Gilani and Dr. Bauer over on uh, ILD and maybe have rheumatology help out as well. So um, I've learned quite a bit in a very short amount of time. Um, so systemic sclerosis, you know, with limited cutaneous, uh, with the skin thickening to the distal extremities uh, versus diffuse cutaneous skin thickening involving proximal extremities and torso. Uh, one thing that was, uh, you know, that we see between 
whether here just in term home versus on PH or IOD. Um, the development of pulmonary hypertension is more likely in, uh, in the patients with illuminated cutaneous. Um, and the development of ILD is sometimes considered more likely in the setting of diffused cutaneous as well. Um, and uh, in the scleroderma lung study, uh, no significant differences in the frequency of alveolitis on a uh, high-res CT scan between the two types. Um, but you, know, you, you do see the very, um, very significant pulmonary hypertension in these patients as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the diseases and then some of the labs that you're getting on them. This isn't obviously all inclusive um, in regards to that workup. So uh, your anti-SCL70, um, also known as anti-copoisomerase, your anti-centromere antibodies, um, and uh, as well as the anti-RNA polymerase 3. There are some of these non-criteria antibody tests that were um, a little bit lower when you're getting kind of this scleroderma type panel. Um, the anti-U3 RMP uh, kind of listed all there, but um, more than 50% of patients with uh, systemic sclerosis will have one of those first three antibodies that are listed there. Um, and then uh, the, the presence of uh, these systemic sclerosis um, specific antibodies uh, may help predict some disease phenotype as well. Um, another thing that I remember, I think in like board prep was like um, with, with Crest, like anti-centromere, anti-crestomere, right? Kind of, uh, yeah, not, not as helpful as I thought. All right, um, so in regards to the high-res CT, it, it, it'll show potentially this either NSIP pattern versus a UIP type pattern. Um, Typically, well, from what we're seeing is, you know, the NSIP pattern is a little bit more common, um, and that'll show you those ground glass opacities, a peripheral distribution, subperipheral base load predominance versus the UIP pattern that we'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, this was a, uh, a patient that had scleroderma-related ILD um, and, and the pathology, and I actually wanted to add a patient because we had one, but I did not grab their images. Um, Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, patients with RA will typically have a UIP type pattern on high res CT scan um, and it's been shown to have a worsened survival uh, versus patients that have an SIP type pattern. Um, there was a study that was taking a look at um, uh, the number of patients and I put it in my notes that I can send out as well. So a definite UIP uh, pattern was seen in 24% of the patients uh, that they looked at that had rheumatoid uh, arthritis associated ILD. These patients uh, were shown to have a worse survival than those without that pattern. The median survival was 3.2 years versus 6.6 .6 years. Um, so pretty significant. Um, and when you're, when you're checking for RA, you get your rheumatoid factors as well as your anti-CCP antibodies. Um, and some of the risk factors for uh, patients to have rheumatoid uh, RA-related ILD um, include smoking, again, high levels of these antibodies, an older age at the time of diagnosis, and male, so this guy, old guy smoking, right? Um, there's also the um, dermatomyositis and polymyositis. You know, this is characterized by skeletal muscle inflammation, can involve the skin and the lungs, and kind of going through some of the classic pictures, the heliotrope rash, the gotrans papules, yeah, there's the shawl sign, and this was like a little bit more cartoon um, of it, the, the proximal muscle weakness, uh, some of the nail changes, the gotrans papules on their hands, the heliotrope rash as well. In regards to some of the myositis panel, um, there are a number of, um, Tests that you can send for. I started. I started with these um, in regards to the anti jo one for uh, kind of associated with the dermatomyositis. Another one that I remember this was like anti jo one jo lung uh, involvement. So the anti mi two um, SRP kind of associated with the polymyositis and necrotizing myositis. Um, the ur the u one RNP uh, and the pl twelve. There's I looked through some of the, um, the, the companies that send like this myositis panel um, and there's a, there's a couple of different places and 
I, I didn't clarify for our myositis panel. Is that that's a send out? Is that correct? And where does that? Yeah. Quest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, like the same thing, you know, there's a number of the panels and I think National Jewish also has their own uh, panel as well that I had seen um, in regards to this. So it kind of goes a number of ways. I do have a question up here. So it is broken up on a couple different slides, so I will read it and then we can come back to it if we need to. Um, so 51-year-old woman with no significant past medical history, uh, has fever, cough, shortness of breath. Her symptoms began eight weeks before with a flu-like illness. Uh, initially started to feel better, but her symptoms returned, uh, prompting her to see her PCP. Now has a productive cough of yellow sputum despite two courses of antibiotics. No hemoptysis, no chest pain or GI symptoms, but has lost 10 pounds since becoming ill over the last two months. Uh, has never smoked, does not drink alcohol or use illicit drugs, does not have a prior history of recurrent um, respiratory tract infections. Uh, physical exam is noted for uh, fever, otherwise stable vital signs. Uh, oxygen saturation is 99% on two liters. Right-sided crackles noted on inspiration. The remaining of the, the remainder of the exam are normal. Lab, lab uh, tests reveal white, white blood cell count of 14,000 with an elevated neutrophil count. Sputum culture and acid fast bacilli are negative. IGRA is negative. Uh, HIV is non-reactive. Chest x-ray that I will show showing a red upper lobe consolidation and some CTs that go with it. They did go to a BAL bronchoscopy biopsy that was non-diagnostic. Um, this is the CT scan. And I will go over the options in a second. Is this organizing pneumonia, pulmonary mucormycosis, lipoid pneumonia, or septic emboli? So I hear some organizing pneumonias. And, and whoops, yep. Uh, and that's the, the answer. And kind of the teaching point there is um, can be associated. Um, in following a uh, viral or bacterial type infection, that's kind of what she ended up having, um, as well as associated with, again, malignancies, drugs, exposure to certain fumes, um, will have a cough, can have this fever, malaise, dyspnea, uh, after this uh, flu-like illness. Um, so gonna get into a little bit of like the, the bread and butter of some of the high-res CT type stuff that you'll see. So, there's like one thing you want to burn into your brain is the typical UIP pattern. Um, because what, yes. One more time, I'm sorry. Okay. So the viral infection can precede it. If in, yeah. 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 Kind of persistent. Yeah. Exactly, and some, uh, at least like out in Sterling Heights as well, um, some are getting these prolonged steroid courses um, because of that. And uh, so when you're, you know, when you're at the IOD conference, you'll hear them talk about, okay, you know, I don't see any honeycombing, no traction bronchiectasis and things like that, because they're checking off, are these uh, findings suggestive of a typical UIP pattern or not? So uh, in regards to the, the distribution, Basal predominance, so plural, uh, honeycombing, reticulation, that traction bronchiectasis that we were talking about, 
Um, and then, you know, again, a lot of this also depends on, you know, what's going underlying, but um, the, the big point is the multidisciplinary meeting uh, to go over this so that you are multiple people in the, in the right setting. You're talking about your history because we are the ones that often see them clinically in clinic. Um, and then you have radiology there, rheumatology, some of your other things to go over. So this is a nice uh, little image here. We'll give chest x-ray conference a little bit of break. Um, you get honeycombing, you're seeing that traction bar uh, with the, the fibrosis adjacent to it, just really pulling along. This is one just kind of cuts um, of that as you go more uh, basal, you're starting to see the honeycombing again um, in regards to the patient. Um, did I mention in here the, yeah, it's a, and again, more basally predominant that really classic honeycombing that you're seeing. Um, and then you have the probable UIP pattern. Um, and one of the big things here is honeycombing is absent. Um, and again, you're discussing this in your meeting. In regards to the high res um, CT, uh, this first sentence essentially, the radiologist must first determine the presence or absence of a pattern that's typical of UIP. Um, so in regards to uh, that, some of, the, some of the findings may uh, lead you towards some of these uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Uh, and then at that multidisciplinary meeting, you're talking about what are some of the next steps that you can do to help you answer some of these questions in regards to are you going to go to potential bronchoscopy, biopsy, uh, surgical and biopsy, things like that. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the BAL guidelines in the diagnosis of ILD. These are from ATS. Um, and uh, the initial, uh, you know, after you, you do the initial clinical and radiological evaluation, um, BAL may be useful in the diagnosis uh, if you don't have that kind of confident UIP pattern on high-risk CT. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, you're, you're you're having a patient undergo a procedure, no procedure that you do is benign, just like you know I, anything you give here, IV fluids even, nah, not a benign thing. So risk versus the benefits in regards to how useful is this going to be uh, to help me with my patient. Um, so, um, you know, taking a look at the, the BAL pattern, uh, which I have a slide coming up as well, may help guide you in regards to um, certain disease processes. Um, however, one big thing um, I think we all know, the BAL analysis alone will not get you to the diagnosis of a specific ILD. Um, however, let's do, you do cytology on the BAL and that comes back positive. That's going to help you quite a bit there, right? Um, and no prognostic value and will not predict the response to therapy. Um, so some of the recommendations uh, in patients. So, you know, for patients with suspected ILD um, that they can that you essentially can do a BAL. Uh, I think this is kind of uh, common sense that you're gonna do your BAL target based on the area where there's uh, disease on the high-risk CT, right? Um, in regards to just kind of your typical, you know, where we like to get the great returns. Um, cell count differential, as well as if you're doing your uh, infectious etiology uh, workup as well. And um, so some of the, the BAL type patterns, um, kind of what you'll see normally in, in your cell count and differential um, versus your lymphocytic predominant, neutrophilic predominant, eosinophilic predominant um, on the, the patient. So I have a couple slides from the ATS to go over some of those as well. Uh, and again, this is the, the normal adult non-smoker BAL differential counts. And then, so you're starting to see some of the uh, lymphocytic predominant that falls down in this lens, NSIP, sarcoid, HP, um, drug induced, as well as if you have um, eosinophilic patterns, or you think of some of the eosinophilic pneumonias, um, neutrophilic may put you along the lines of uh, infection. So it can guide you a little bit, um, but again, it's not going to be the end all be all. Um, some of the more classic ones that I've also seen on questions while doing um, board preparation uh, in regards to like the CD4, CD8 one. Um, 
highly specific for sarcoidosis in the absence of other inflammatory cell types so that CD4 to CD8 count greater than four, a ratio greater than four, um, a lymphocyte differential greater than 50% kind of can lead you towards the HP route, um, a neutrophil differential greater than 50%, acute lung injury, aspiration, infection, um, an eosinophil differential count greater than 25%, uh, almost diagnostic of acute or chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. There was a question that was literally just, did you know that sentence or not? Um, and then uh, another cell count is uh, if you see mast cells, lymphocytes, uh, greater than 50%, uh, suggestive of acute hypersensitivity, pneumonitis. Um, we got some time still. Okay. And so then the question comes Does my patient need a biopsy? Um, and again, me, the third year fellow, I am not making that decision by myself. I am doing that discussion similar to tumor board, right? You're not making that decision by yourself. You're going over uh, with, a, with a group of specialists in that multidisciplinary conference to do what's best for the patient. So um, a surgical lung biopsy will help you get a confident diagnosis, um, except again, in those cases where you have that, these are the typical UIP patterns. Um, and this is not to say that biopsy is always necessary to make that diagnosis, right? Um, so optimal biopsies will be multiple biopsies from sites of active disease, but also showing that transition to normal and diseased lung. Um, and then open general question in regards to, do you guys know like the mortality in patients that are undergoing surgical lung biopsy? I'm sorry. So there's, there's data for, in regards to like, um, which I thought was interesting because it was like, is this elective or not? Um, and then was this via VATS or not as well? So if you can, you can imagine that that will change it quite a bit, right? Um, so this was a study um, done by Hutchinson that was uh, published in 2016. Over almost 2,800 patients with ILD that were undergoing surgical lung biopsy. Uh, the overall in-hospital in mortality was 6.4% total. Um, however, if you're taking a look at the patients that were elective, mortality was 1.7% versus non-elective, almost 16%. So quite high um, risk factors were increasing age, open versus fats, and uh, being a male. And yeah, yeah. And uh, I got literally just one slide on this because it was something that piqued my interest a little bit uh, in regards to cryobiopsy. So um, cryobiopsy essentially through the bronchoscope, you're passing the cryoprobe, it's gonna freeze and it's gonna pull a bigger biopsy is what the, the hope is. Um, and then as that freezes, it's gonna be a little bit bigger than it can come out of the, the actual bronchoscope. So you gotta come out and block with the scope and the thing. So, this is often done under rigid bronchoscopy. And then uh, the question is, am I getting more, more tissue and better information for my pathologist to make this diagnosis? Um, and is this less risky than doing a surgical lung biopsy? Am I getting more information than a transbronchial biopsy? And so on and so forth. So that's what they were going. Um, and uh, so what, what they did actually in one of these, I don't know if I put it up, yeah. So, what they were doing was they, um, they followed these patients that were getting uh, actually both biopsies, transbronchial, as well as surgical lung biopsy, which was interesting, uh, to evaluate the concordance of the diagnoses between the two. Um, and they saw that it was poorly concordant, uh, only 38% in agreement, which is very interesting. Um, and retrospectively, the surgical lung biopsies carried more weight than the transbronchial lung biopsies for the final diagnosis at that multidisciplinary conference. Um, so you're, you're, again, the risk versus benefits, there's multiple different things coming in from it from both ways, but this was one that I thought was interesting because they did the, they did both biopsies at the same time and they didn't really correlate with each other, right? No matter how many ridges we want to do and go ahead and do all these procedures and endobronchial blockers and all that kind of stuff, like I love it, but, uh, it wasn't, uh, it, it's just very interesting to see that, uh, it wasn't super, uh, super correlating, but uh, there, there's more, more information to come from that. Uh, a larger cryoprobe, thank you, Dr. Peralta. Um, 
lead to a higher concordance. Okay, thank you. So using a larger cryo probe can lead to higher concordance. Um, one other thing in regards to like um, with, with like transbronchial biopsies, you're getting a lot of crushed artifact with the, the forceps. So a lot, a lot can go through um, in regards, a lot goes into doing the, the procedures for these patients. Um, some of the stuff, I'm sorry, some of the stuff that I wanted to talk about was, um, I'm not gonna get too into detail, but again, stuff that piqued my interest uh, in, in regards to, oops. So uh, inhaled process cyclins in pH due to uh, interstitial lung disease. Um, so, you know, these patients that have group three pH, really bad ILD, uh, the question was, can we use these inhaled process cyclins to, to help them? Um, they were assigned to either placebo or the inhaled Tyveso. Uh, the primary endpoint was um, change in the six minute walk test from baseline to week 16. So what they did was, uh, I'll get on the next slide. Uh, they did a six minute walk test at baseline, then at weeks four, eight, 12, and 16. Um, and each six minute walk test was performed within about an hour after the most recent um, uh, drug, either the Taveso or the placebo. Um, and then they measured the six minute walk test uh, as you're moving forward. So uh, a total of 326 patients, almost 163 in each. Um, and what we saw was uh, an improved exercise capacity from baseline, uh, which again, they used the six minute walk test compared to placebo. Uh, as well as uh, an improvement in some of their secondary endpoints, which was the um, BNP on these patients as well. Um, I just included this for completeness sake, but it was pretty comparable uh, demographics between the groups, but the, um, I don't have the, the numbers. Um, uh, here we go, change from baseline. So um, pretty significant change from baseline uh, in the inhaled group versus don't have both. Um, here we go. The median change was yeah, what is it? How come I cannot see this as well as I thought I would? They had better six minute walk tests. Um, so I have I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and that was published from January of this year. And the case I'm presenting, you saw, Hafsa. So this is uh, courtesy of the one and only Dr. Gaurav Sharma, uh, who presented this case at chest x-ray conference last week. Uh, so it's a 70-year-old female, 74-year-old female who had IPF, um, was on antifibrotics. Um, and this was the um, CT scan for them. Uh, ultimately, I don't know who read this, if you want to read it again. To, uh, so this is one they ended up having this combined CPFE type picture, um, and uh, their echo echocardiogram showed uh, an enlarged RV, some reduced RV function, estimated period pressure was 69, dilated RA. I don't have their cath on here, but it essentially did show uh, pre-diabetic um, Oh, Donna, you saw this patient too, not that long ago, I think. Yeah, and pH. Follow up. Um, so. On uh, March 10th, uh, the six minute walk test was 133 meters, which is 34% predicted. So on uh, May 25th was seen recently in clinic on August 4th and six minute walk test increased to 256 meters, which is 65% predicted, right? Um, pretty darn impressive. Um, and what I'm seeing in my head is, uh, <laughs> you set the bar high, Chris. Um, so, that's mostly of what I wanted to talk about. I have some slides in here in regards to just IPF and some of the treatments for it that I think is kind of past the scope of 
the the talk i did want to just hit on one point because it hits close to my heart gerd in ipf is a bad thing uh it can contribute to fibrosis progression uh and they suggest that clinicians can use regular antacid treatment uh and patients with ipf so if you watched me eating the, the indian food the other day like that was me just struggling and having crazy reflux nonstop. and i'm a big uh, advocate for pepsin so i need some financial disclosures uh that would be one um i do just have one quick question in regards to that and it's, again a little bit of a loaded slide i apologize um, so the ATS ERS, um, just talking about the treatment of IPF, they made a conditional recommendation for the use of antacid patients for patients with gastroesophageal reflux and IPF. Uh, the question essentially says, which statement accurately, accurately reflects the evidence used to support this recommendation? So number or letter A, um, acid reflux in contrast to non-acid reflux uh, and microaspiration contributes to repeated lung injury in patients with IPF. I feel like that's me. Uh, treatment for GERD should be directed to those patients with clinically apparent symptoms. That also applies to me. PPI therapy for GERD increases the risk of community pneumonia in those receiving treatment. Um, abnormal gastroesophageal reflux has been observed in 90% of patients with IPF, of whom 40% have occult reflux. D. I was just doing that because I know Crystal got us with that with the face. Like no poker face at all, it's D. Um, so gastroesophageal reflux uh, has been observed in up to 90% of patients with IPF uh, based on um, high resolution manometry as well as uh, pH monitoring. Um, more than 40% of, of the patients do not have classic symptoms of heartburn. Uh, and some of the observational retrospective studies suggest that in patients treated with uh, reflux with either PPI or H2 blocker, um, there was a slower decline in the force vital capacity, uh, as well as radiographic um, fibrosis. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, no, right, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and same thing, like similar to what we were talking about with our other patient in regards to how frequent those symptoms and stuff were happening, but now, again, this was a question from some of the board preparation as well, um, <clears throat> but uh, the data is obviously a little bit more fuzzy, but yeah, um, my cough did get better with the two parts of the methazole, so, <laughs> yeah, for what it's worth. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. And then that's interesting. And uh, like, even again, I didn't include just because there's so much, like, there's some of the um, the markers that they're doing to to lead towards diagnosis as well, which is all just very interesting. A lot is going on, and even from like one of the the groups, I think out in like Vanderbilt, um, is they're publishing some data. Again, there's it goes from a number of sides, right? There's always going to be data going for one versus the other and things like that. But um, you know, some increasing data that they're using cryobiopsy and all that kind of stuff. But it all just ultimately depends on. Your, the institution, what you got, who you're working with, and everything together, because they can go, you know, you can find data, I think, probably for each side of it. But that's very interesting. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Yeah. 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 I, I fell down that rabbit hole for a good four hours uh, <laughs> between going from like study to study because again, it, it's a lot based on the institution, the group that's doing it. Um, and then we don't always look into, you know, the patient population, the exact demographics across everything like that. Um, and then I was watching some YouTube videos of it for like hours on end. So <laughs> I just fell down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting stuff, though. Thanks a lot. <laughs>